Welcome to the STAR Working Group's 2022 Reports and Planning Webinar. Today's session is the second of two webinars and will feature reports on primary alloimmune response, allo-specific B and T cell immune memory, attributes of HLA antibodies, and gallery Q&A discussions on all topics. Attendees are strongly encouraged to share their questions and feedback as the group plans for a pre-meeting event at AST's Cutting Edge of Transplantation 2022 meeting. STAR Working Group projects have been proudly supported by AST and ASHI. Today, the group looks forward to sharing these reports with members of both organizations. Our moderators for today's webinar are Dr. Anat Tambor, Research Professor of Surgery, Organ Transplantation at Northwestern University's Comprehensive Transplant Center, and Dr. Peter Nickerson, Distinguished Professor of Internal Medicine and Immunology at the University of Manitoba's Max Reddy College of Medicine. Before we begin the main presentation, we do have a few housekeeping notes. I've just launched a viewership polling question, um, which is now displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcement. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available next week. When the videos are posted, we will provide an update to ASHI and, a and AST members on how to view the recordings. As noted, attendees are strongly encouraged to participate in today's webinar, but please note your lines have all been muted so that only the panelists can be heard clearly live and for the recordings. If you do have a question for our panelists during the webinar, we recommend that you participate by using the Q&A button, which is right next to your chat button in the Zoom webinar panel. Questions submitted via the chat window may be missed during the presentation. All right, it is now my pleasure to turn the session over to our moderators, Dr. Tambor and Nickerson, to begin our presentations. Thank you, Brian, and welcome to everyone who is joining us uh, to this uh, second session of the STAR Working Group uh, Reports and Planning. Uh, we will review uh, three uh, groups today, or the outcome of uh, three groups, the uh, primary alloimmunity and the assays to identify T and B cell memory will be going uh, first. They will go back to back, um, after which we will pause for a few minutes for uh, Q&A. Uh, as Brian said, please do put them in the chat as we go. And um, Peter and myself will uh, be uh, reading those questions then to the group. Uh, and then we'll uh, take uh, the, uh, we'll uh, invite the uh, attribute uh, group to present their reports and we'll have questions uh, following that. And uh, hopefully we'll have sufficient time to get all the groups together. Uh, the main purpose of this um, session is really to get your feedback. So I, please, uh, we'll keep on encouraging you to put your questions uh, and comments uh, as we'll go. And I think uh, with that, we will start with the primary alloimmunity group. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Roz Menon and Peter Nickerson. Roz, Peter. Great, Anat. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me participate again this year. And it's my pleasure being joined today by Peter Nickerson to present our, our working group report on primary alloimmune responses. This report is also on behalf of VAST, Cosmoleopsis, and David Pinelli. We have no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose, and we are not planning on discussing off-label use. With that, I'll turn this part of the session over to Peter to present. Thanks very much, Roz and uh, Anat. Um, so, in the primary alloimmune group, we're really talking about what turns on an immune response from the beginning. And we're gonna break it into both the HLA-driven uh, immune responses and non-HLA immune responses. And I'm gonna focus on the HLA-driven uh, immune responses. And, and I think what everybody's aware of is the concept of HLA molecular mismatch uh, being uh, a tool that might be used to assess pre-transplant risk for developing a primary alloimmune response. This came out in our 2017 and 19 reports. And what we've seen is an evolution in a number of different computational technologies. There's HLA uh, matchmaker, where it's looking at surface uh, uh, different amino acids that are um, seen by the recipient uh, that, are not on, that are on the donor molecule. We have the uh, uh, Pirsch uh, or net MHC pan driven approach, which is trying to look at allopeptides that are being presented by the recipient HLA class two to the uh, uh, recipient's uh, T cells. Um, we have the Cambridge amino acid mismatch uh, strategy. There's also a similar strategy now out of uh, the Netherlands looking at amino acids that are solvent, a surface solvent uh, 
amino acids. And then we have also another technique uh, by the Cambridge group looking at electrostatic charge on the whole molecule and looking at the differential charges that exist between a recipient and a donor, thinking that that's actually participating in driving uh, rec allo recognition by, um, by B cells. Uh, next slide, Ross. So the, the hypothesis around HLA molecular mismatching is that uh, allo recognition is more likely the higher uh, the donor HLA dissimilarity exists uh, compared to the recipient HLA molecules. This can be dissimilarity that's defined at the B cell level in terms of what the B cell receptor sees or at the T cell level in terms of what the T cell receptor sees. And the determinants of immunogenicity are gonna be the amino acid polymorphism, the number, their position, but also the tertiary structure and the physiochemical properties of these uh, amino acids that again can lead to B cell recognition uh, uh, epitopes. Now, we also have the recipient class two, which can lead to T cell recognition of allopeptides that have been processed uh, by the uh, recipients APCs. Now in the bottom panel here, we're just showing that what's the difference between a molecular mismatch, and here I'm using the epilet mismatch of matchmaker to display this, versus a whole antigen mismatch strategy. And what you can clearly see is that for a 1DR mismatch, you can have a whole range of epilet mismatches. And if I get you to advance, Ross, if we think about two recipients, classically, when we talk about DR mismatching, we'd say, well, recipient B is worse off because they have a 2DR mismatch as compared to recipient A. However, when you look at the molecular level, it's quite clear that recipient A has many more epilet mismatches as compared to recipient B. So the molecular information is more granular. It's retaining more of the information of the degree of dissimilarity. And we think that's why it's a superior approach. Next. Now, one of the things that's true is that when you use any of these methodologies, they're very highly correlated. And this has been published by a number of different groups showing that the degree of amino acid mismatches correlates quite nicely with the epilet mismatches here in the top panels, or below that, the Pierce score correlates with the degree of ABC, DR, DQ mismatches, or if you take Pierce score and compare it to matchmaker, again, you have a lot of high degree of uh, correlation. So I think what we're really seeing with many of these methodologies is they're really talking about the, the degree of dissimilarity of the donor versus the recipient. Next. If we, there we go. So when we compare, for example, the classical two uh, uh, DQ mismatches, and that's in the, the bottom um, left panel, we're seeing the uh, yellow uh, areas being the polymorphic amino acids on the surface of the donor um, molecules. But classically, we'd say this is a 2DQ mismatch. And if we add those together, we get the sum. And when you look at what's the probability of that actually correlating with DQ DSA, you actually see in an ROC curve analysis, your AUC is only 0.54, a little better than flipping a coin. If you go to the epilet mismatch level and you now look and sum up all these yellow areas on both molecules, you get 12 epilet mismatches. And using the summation approach, you'll find that your AUC uh, for DQ DSA goes up to 0.72. But if you actually break it down even further and you say, I'm gonna consider each individual molecule with the degree of epilet mismatch that's existing on its surface compared to the other one, and I do a single molecule mismatch strategy, my AUC actually goes up to 0.84. So the single molecule consideration, as you think about whether you're likely to drive a, 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 an antibody response, is a more uh, accurate way uh, than comparing it to sums. Next slide. Now, when we get to HLA molecular mismatching, there's a whole bunch of technical requirements we really have to, to think about. One is high resolution typing. If we're really gonna get to understanding the molecular dissimilarity, we really need to get the high resolution typing of our donors and recipients. We need accurate definition of what constitutes the methodology of HLA mismatch assessment. Are we looking at the single molecule HLA mismatch score, especially when we're correlating it against the specific DSA to that molecule? Or if we're gonna consider the relative contribution of each of the various HLA loci when we're thinking about an outcome like BPAR or graft survival. We also need accurate definition of outcome study. Um, are we doing prospective DSA monitoring? How are we defining uh, that, a, that a, a cutoff for defining that there's actually really an antibody present? How are we defining BPAR? Are we doing it as TCMR, ABMR? Is it on a four cause or a surveillance or protocol biopsy? 
And we have to be able to adjust for confounders in our analysis. We also need accurate assessment of the molecular mismatch model accuracy. Here, what I'm talking about is, are we actually doing uh, good uh, statistical modeling? Do we have external validity of the final model? Can we demonstrate superiority of the molecular mismatch over a conventional HLA approach? Are we adjusting for the effect of mismatching of different loci versus clinical outcome? And then do we have a comparison of the different algorithms that we're talking about today, these various methods, head to head? So far, we really have very little data on head to head comparisons to try and figure out which model is going to do better than another. And then ultimately, we need computational algorithm viability. And what I mean by that is, who's going to look after the data library that's supporting these algorithms in terms of curation and validating the accuracy of the HLA molecules that are being put into this, uh, this library? When we get next to clinical validity, what, what do we got so far to date? Well, there's been a number of different clinical studies where they're looking at actual clinical outcomes using various uh, analytical approaches. I'm giving you four of the studies here that all used HLA Matchmaker. Some use some score of applets, others use the single molecule. Others use what is called the sum of the antibody verified applets that Matchmaker allows you to, um, to, to select on. You can look at some of the loci, you can look at all of the loci. But what we've seen so far is that the AUC or C statistic, when we're looking at the low size specific DSA, is performing somewhere in the 0.8 to 0.89 range, especially when you're getting down to more of a single molecule type approach. And if you look at a C statistic for any de novo DSA, and that was done by the uh, group out of Leuven, uh, Martin Nason's group, where they showed that uh, just taking DQ actually seemed to correlate with any DSA with an AUC of 0.74. More importantly, what do we know about the um, applet mismatches in these studies in terms of independent correlates of DSA, ABMR, TCMR, or graph loss, i.e. our clinical outcomes? And we see that we're starting to see consistency across these studies that these uh, approaches are predicting our clinical outcomes. Next. So what's the clinical utility ultimately in terms of looking at a primary immune response risk using uh, a molecular mismatching approach? I think we could use it as a prognostic biomarker. This is in the context of a drug development tool for clinical trial design, for risk stratification or enrichment in these trials. But this requires predefined cutoffs to be able to categorize levels of risk if you're gonna use it as this uh, kind of a tool. We might also use it as a predictive biomarker to guide immunosuppressive therapy in support of precision medicine. Do we get the right therapy to the right person? Ideally, this would use it as a continuous variable to avoid the loss of any information that we typically get when we start categorizing people. Next. The problem with the clinical utility of either of these prognostic or predictive biomarkers is we need prospective clinical trials to validate our hypothesis that actually it can be used in these ways. Next. Finally, I want to talk about the possible clinical utility as an allocation algorithm. And I'm just going to say this is not ready for prime time. Ideally, rather than just looking at the, F, uh, the molecular mismatch load of the differences between donor and recipient, we'd actually identify the individual immunogenic HLA targets. We know that not all mismatches are created equal. So in terms of B cell targets, we'd like to know what surface epitopes are actually driving an immune response. Or for T cell targets, what allopeptides specifically are driving these response? And we cannot assume one, one is more important than the other, just because we can measure one more easily than the other. And it requires large databases of diversity of genetic backgrounds. Not all genetic backgrounds are equivalent. We know this. There is a key, lo, uh, key focus of this at the International Histocompatibility Workshop in Leiden in 2022. I've given you the link here, and we hope to see you there. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Roz now. Great, Peter, thank you. Well, now I'll cover our report on non-HLA molecular mismatching. Um, in our prior report for STAR, um, we summarized the many candidate gene approaches for specific high-risk genotypes. And these studies identified specific single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And these SNPs were really focused on calcineurin and mycophenolic mopatil metabolism as well as some associations with acute rejection. But as we pointed out in the report, these uh, reports have not been validated in a robust fashion in multiple transplant populations, nor across multiple transplant cohorts. 
And indeed, a, a fascinating study by Hernandez and Fuentes looking at disparities between donor and recipient genotypes in non-HLA. This is a genome-wide association study in 2,000 donor recipient pairs with a replication cohort of nearly 6,000 individuals. They were not able to find a statistically significant association outside the HLA region. But be that as it may, there still is a recognition of that maybe the use of these kind of methodologies is not specific enough now that we have the ability to sequence DNA. And a, an excellent example of this is the recent publication by the Columbia Transplant Group identifying a genomic mismatch in the limb zinc finger domain containing one protein or limbs one. They used a different approach. They called it a loss of function approach and genomic collision which they define as a specific donor recipient genotype combination where the recipient was homozygous for a gene intersecting deletion and that individual received a transplant, the donor transplant was non-homozygous, meaning they had the ability to express the protein. In this rather reasonably sized study, the LIMS1 deletion in the recipient with a non-homozygous donor had a 60% higher risk of either T cell or antibody media rejection as shown in the panel on the right uh, in the red line. And, and these recipients were also demonstrated to more likely have anti lims one antibodies. They demonstrated this initially by a proteome array uh, and then confirmed it, some of these individuals using a homegrown li ELISA, but they were not seeing an association with uh, graft failure. This work has been confirmed in another transplant cohort by Kaliskin and colleagues um, about 400 uh, individuals, I believe, uh, mostly European, but it was not confirmed in the decaf genomics geno3 cohorts by Bill Edding and colleagues. Um, the use of whole genome assessment of donor and recipient has become increasingly popular, and we will like to highlight several uh, important uh, publications. A study from the Vien Vienna group uh, involving two large Austrian cohorts using genome-wide genetic mismatches and non-synonymous SNPs in transmembrane and secreted proteins, those that could be potentially accessible to immune responding G uh, cells, was correlated to five-year allograft failure. And as shown here on the right, the higher interquartile regions, individuals with more of these mismatches had a higher likelihood of graft failure over time. Another approach by the iGene Train Consortium, this is a consortium now of five large primarily European ancestry cohorts, but there is embedded a small cohort of African-American ancestry. They performed a GWAS analysis of about 11,000 donor recipient pairs. But here they used a different technique. They calculated what's called a polygenic risk score. Now polygenic risk scores are a number that estimates um, the, the, a number of genetic variants on an individual phenotype. And typically it's calculated as a weighted sum of trait associated alleles. And the score can, can quantify like the cumulative effects of a number of different loci, which individually may not have, have good predictive ability. So you can imagine with a complex clinical disorder that a single gene may not be sufficient. Uh, in this situation, they looked at the polygenic risk score for uh, estimated GFR based on a formula and an association of decline in kidney function in native kidney uh, disease. They established um, in this large cohort that the polygenic risk score from native kidney disease correlated quite strongly with early post-transplant function. However, this polygenic risk score did not correlate to late transplant function defined as at five years, nor did it associate with late graft failure. And finally, another novel approach has been performed by Barbara Murphy's group in the GOCAR cohort. As you may recall, this was a prospective cohort across a number of medical centers in the US, uh, Australia, and on Europe. And they uh, looked at 385 donor and recipient pairs of DNA. They also looked at specifically the proportion of identical by descent or the PIBD score. Shown here, they, they utilized an association of genetic ancestry from the thousand genome model. And you can see there's individuals along this line that showed very strong correlation with genetic ancestry between donor and recipient. But what they found is that when there was a significant disparity in ancestry, they identified a, a, a significant association of early vascular fibrosis or CV lesions, and also a reduction in allograft survival over time. 
And finally, I, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about NK cells, and we'll be talking more about that in the attribute section uh, and how NK cell genetic comp uh, compatibility may affect outcomes. Uh, this work is summarized in, in these panels by um, Martin Nason's group, and this is Alice Koenig's uh, recent publication in Jason, where she demonstrates the presence uh, or the absence of a so-called missing self when there is an absence of appropriate self MHC to uh, interact with the inhibitory cure as a ligand and deactivate or, or uh, suppress NK cell activation, those individuals may have ongoing NK cell activation. And uh, a, a brief aspect of this that's quite interesting is that in, in biopsies with microvascular injury, um, with patients that did have DSA but did not demonstrate complement activation, those that had the presence of missing cell had a higher uh, rate of graft failure over time. They did further work in this in a larger cohort using high resolution genotyping of about 900 recipients with 14 inhibitory cure genes. And they defined missing self as the absence of corresponding donor HLA class one antigen in the combination of a specific inhibitory cure gene and was able and identified 400, about 400 donor recipient pairs. While the presence of one missing self was not associated with any increased risk of negative outcomes, the presence of so-called high missing self, that is two or three, was independently associated with microvascular inflammation and biopsy, transplant glomerulopathy, and antibody-mediated rejection. I would point out that while missing self was an independent association, um, that HLA-DSA was similarly an independently uh, association and also a stronger association and also missing self in this small cohort did not have any confer any risk of graft failure. So in summary and conclusion, uh, retrospective studies correlating genetic markers outside of the HLA region of autoimmunity or continued research focus and a recent uh, review by Samira Farouk and colleagues in AJT uh, highlights some of these uh, concepts. Uh, the primary sources for genetic association studies have to be carefully examined and the Canada genes validated further in appropriate powered cohorts prior to our recommendation of any clinical implementation. And indeed, these associations need to be adjusted for all clinical covariates that may be associated with outcome. I'm not disparaging any of the prior studies. There was significant um, uh, adjustment, but for one example, in, in so many of these registries is the lack of immunosuppressive drug levels. And we know that uh, this is an important aspect in limiting the development of de novo DSA. Many of the associations identified in these studies may not be direct modulators of the immune response, but rather driven by differences in donor expression of non-HLA proteins. And these studies may actually be identifying risk alleles for negative grad outcomes, not true alloantigens. Uh, mechanistic investigation is still needed to better characterize the impact of these mismatch proteins on transplant outcome. And finally, these recent findings about the participation of NK cells in, in ABMR and microvascular injury are intriguing. We'll talk more about that in, in the third section of this presentation and require further studies to determine if cure ligand analysis might be used as a risk stratification tool. With that, I'm going to turn over this meeting to uh, my colleague, Oriel Bestard. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and uh, participate in this symposium uh, on behalf of, um, uh, of my colleagues that uh, we developed this um, this topic uh, regarding memory T and B cell uh, immune memory. Uh, we don't have any relevant financial relationship to this close and there is no off-level use here either. Uh, so this is the group uh, that built this, this attribute, Anita Chong, Sebastian Hyde, Mandy Ford, and myself. So uh, just uh, to start, uh, we would like to just give a, an, a brief overview of what had uh, been agreed in the previous STAR meeting. Uh, and as you can see here in 2017, 
um, mainly uh, what was uh, agreed is that we should focus basically on, on the clinical background of, of uh, transplant recipients, uh, uh, such as uh, previous sensitizing events, uh, such as previous transplant pregnancies or transfusions. And uh, the test that we had in our hands that we could rely on was basically uh, based on serological memory. So based on the presence of donor specific antibodies at the, at the time of transplantation, and also uh, those that are appearing at the very early times after uh, transplantation. And uh, there was an agreement also to say that uh, there is a need for tests detecting cellular immune memory in absence of HLA antibodies. And in 2019, as you can see here, uh, there were some uh, new studies uh, suggesting uh, that there were some uh, new technologies that were able uh, to assess or to track uh, in, the in the peripheral blood uh, the presence of uh, HLA specific memory B cells or donor reactive memory B cells, but uh, that they had um, um, some important challenges in, in terms of trying to identify uh, donor these donor specific uh, cells. So regarding the first uh, block of this topic, um, allo or donor uh, T cell memory, the group has agreed that uh, there are some main or important challenges uh, in quantifying allo or donor reactive memory T cells. And probably one of the most important ones if we want to use uh, an in vitro assay to uh, track uh, what is happening in vivo uh, is the time of assessment, uh, which may directly influence the type of donor antigen presenting pathways, such as, as you all know, uh, either the direct or the indirect or the semi direct pathway. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go through uh, them in detail, but we know that probably um, each one may uh, have a, an important role at different time points of the transplant setting. Uh, so the direct pathway uh, should or, or is most likely to, to be more important at the very beginning uh, of the transplant uh, after transplantation, whereas the semi-direct and the indirect pathway may uh, play a major role uh, where, uh, during the evolution after uh, transplantation. So the second main challenge that we have also agreed uh, uh, is that we need to understand whether we are assessing really only naive versus memory T cell response and whether we want to uh, uh, track donor reactive T cells or we're assessing a response against a panel of uh, alloantigens. And finally, uh, we believe it is also very important to bear in mind that we're uh, only looking at peripheral blood, uh, so we don't know whether this may, il uh, may fully illustrate the global T cell immune response that is originated within secondary lymphoid organs. So what are the assays that we think that uh, we have in our hands to track allo uh, T cell memory? So we can, in the first column, uh, as you can see here, we can track uh, using different uh, approaches by phenotyping, uh, by flow cytometry, the presence in bulk of different uh, T cells uh, uh, with different cells uh, surface markers, uh, but we don't have the information about their antigen specificity. Um, uh, it is a rapid detection and it may correlate with an overall immune risk, uh, but again, we don't uh, have the information whether these cells are uh, antigen and donor specific or not. But so the, it could be a near term bridge for a gross assessment of T cell risk while antigen specific assays are being uh, developed. The second uh, uh, approach or the second group of, of assays is based on a functional assay uh, such as interferon gamma L spot or the uh, activist induced marker assay. And here what we use is a short term, in a short term proculture and we try to detect the presence of interferon gamma producing T cells after, uh, uh, as I said, uh, in a short uh, term uh, culture. Um, this uh, assay requires uh, or it takes in between two to three days to obtain uh, results and it predominantly measures a donor peptide MHC complex reactivity. Uh, so uh, as a challenge or a, a con, it requires, of course, donor tissue, um, uh, and it might be useful for determining frequencies of circulating donor specific T cells based on its uh, functionality. And lastly, we have also the detection uh, using high throughput uh, approaches, the TCR beta chain of the CD R3 um, sequencing of the TCR. And this approach is able to track uh, the presence of circulating uh, donor specific memory T cells, although we don't know the, the functionality uh, of these cells. Uh, we also need donor tissue, and it might take in between three to four days to obtain uh, the results. So what are the novel studies using these assays? So uh, the first one, uh, just to highlight, uh, have been based on bulk analysis using phenotypes of these specific T cells. 
Uh, as you can see here, this first study was done in a, in a pretty low number of, uh, uh, of patients that were all uh, that were uh, receiving uh, Veladacep. And the authors, they uh, um, found that uh, higher frequencies of this CD8, uh, positive CD28 high, uh, high, CD38 high. Uh, T cells uh, were identified in patients that were rejecting under bilatacep as compared to patients that were rejecting uh, under an, uh, um, a classical uh, calcineurin inhibitor tacrolimus. Another approach by assessing the same uh, type of, of T cells was done uh, in these large uh, uh, retrospective studies uh, using uh, evaluating up to 365 kidney transplant uh, patients, and they evaluated them at prior to transplantation, so previous to to, uh, to the transplant. And as you can see here, what they found was uh, they could differentiate between tercels the the frequencies of these cells and those within the highest tercel of CD8 plus CD28 null T cells were those showing the lowest risk uh, of rejection as compared to those with the highest tercile uh, group. And finally, uh, another interesting approach using uh, flow cytometry was, is the assessment of uh, these uh, terminal di differentiated CDA plus uh, positive T cells by analyzing either the FC gamma receptor, the inhibitory one, the R2B, or the activated one, the R3A, uh, in, in two retrospective uh, groups uh, of different uh, transplant patients, and they found uh, that uh, the uh, inhibitory one, the expression of this uh, FC uh, gamma uh, R2B was uh, shown to, to identify patients that were capable of being off uh, and uh, attack rolimus and maintain a good graph uh, function, whereas those patients with high expression of the FC gamma R3 activation one uh, was associated with the uh, allograph rejection. So suggesting that the relative balance of uh, uh, between the inhibitory and the activated FC uh, gamma receptor on CD8 plus T cells may be also a biomarker for risk of rejection. And finally, the only uh, probably uh, study that, uh, that has been uh, done in a, an interventional manner in a multicenter European uh, cohort uh, study was the Selimin um, trial, uh, which used the interferon gamma uh, donor uh, specific Kelly spot. And as you can see here, uh, the authors, what uh, they aim, what they attempt was to use the ELI spot prior to transplantation to allocate patients into different immunosuppressive regimes. So patients showing an ELI spot positive pre-transplantation were uh, receiving uh, TAC, MMF, and estero, so uh, a standard of care uh, regime, whereas the ELI spot negative group uh, receive either TAC monotherapy or also the standard of care. And probably the, unfortunately, as you can see here, the trial uh, was prematurely stopped due to a low recruitment rate. So there was no sufficient power to uh, answer the, the, the main uh, objective of the study. But uh, the associative uh, analysis done by the group, as you can see here in this right panel, in this Kaplan-Meyer uh, biopsy program and rejection free rates, show that in gray, as you can see here, patients with a positive pretraspan ELI spot develop significantly higher rates of rejection as compared to those ELI spot negative receiving the same uh, standard of care treatment. So what is the current status and recommendations uh, for monitoring allodonor active T cell memory? So, uh, so we believe that these uh, short-term co-culture assessing cytokine producing active T cell uh, assays uh, have shown an acceptable negative predictive value but there's a pretty low sensitivity and specificity. And it seems that there are some preliminary or interesting preliminary evidence for the feasibility and clinical utility uh, of the interferon gamma ELI spot assays to rule out the kidney transplant candidates with performant donor T cell memory at high risk of PPAR. And also that there are some preliminary evidence of a specific circulating T cell immunophenotypes without donor antigen specificity that may uh, or that seem that uh, are able to stratify patients with this single immune risk uh, uh, according to the different type of immunosuppressive therapy. But there are some important questions that remain open. So whether uh, does this peripheral blood uh, assessment really illustrates the global anti-donor T cell immune status? And also uh, whether the biological difference and accuracy of tracking memory versus naive and also the different antigen presenting pathways are important when we use an in vitro assay uh, to mimic what is occurring in vivo. So the recommendations of this first part is that uh, we need uh, multi-center prospective and interventional clinical studies to uh, validate and, and confirm this preliminary uh, data.
And regarding the second part, the allo donor uh, B cell uh, memory, so we also uh, identified some important challenges to measure these reactive memory B cells. And the first one is uh, whether do all circulating donor specific memory B cell represent an effector memory B cell capable of differentiating into an antibody secreting cell producing donor specific antibodies. How to interpret presence of the of donor specific memory B cells in presence or absence of serum DSA, and also and likewise to the memory T cell part, whether peripheral blood assessment of memory B cell really illustrate the uh, the germinal center memory B cell activation within uh, secondary lymphoid organs. So these are the main four approaches or technical approaches to uh, track um, allo B cell memory. And in the first column, as you can see, is also using flow cytometry to quantify the frequency and also the phenotype of HLA binding B cells. So here uh, we use either uh, HLA tetramers or HLA coated beads, and we analyze whether B circulating B cells are capable to uh, bind to these uh, HLA uh, particles. So there is no information on whether these memory B cells are capable to differentiate in, into an antibody secreting cells. Uh, but it provides an information of their presence in peripheral blood. So um, uh, with the technical limitation that this assay has, uh, if they can be overcome, uh, this assay might be a promising approach uh, for adaption as a clinical assay. So then we have the, the two uh, approaches in the middle, which uh, are uh, based on the same um, um, approach, which is a polyclonal uh, stimulation of memory B cells in the circulation. Uh, and in the first one, uh, this, uh, uh, this approach, what, we, uh, what is done is that uh, the antibody secreting cells that have been switched uh, into this phenotype, uh, uh, the supernatants of these cultures are assessed uh, by uh, a Luminex-based uh, platform. Uh, whereas the second one uh, assesses the, uh, in a multi, in an early spot uh, based technology or an early spot based platform, the presence of uh, IgG producing uh, memory B cells. So these two approaches did, need the six to eight uh, days of polyclonal uh, proliferation or differentiation of these memory B cells into an antibody secreting cells. And both of them might be useful for approval of principal research studies to assess the presence of these HLA specific memory B cells. And finally, uh, we can also uh, try to track in vitro uh, the presence of circulating antibody secreting cells. And this would be the same approach, but without doing this polyclonal stimulation uh, of memory B cells. The problem of these approaches, as we all know, is that antibody secreting cells may only appear really uh, transiently in peripheral blood. So the likelihood of um, detecting these cells might be uh, pretty uh, low. So these are just to show that the, the two new techniques or the fine tune of these techniques that had been published during these two years. The first one is, is to try to better uh, detect the, the antibodies released by this differentiated antibody secreting cell after, after the polyclonal stimulation. And rather than concentrating uh, the uh, supernatants of this culture, uh, the authors, uh, France, the group from, uh, from France class and Sebastian Hyde, what they did was to isolate the antibodies by using these protein G columns. And as you can see in the right panel, you can see how uh, by using this isolation rather than concentrating the supernatants, they could significantly improve the, detectable, uh, the detection capacity uh, in the uh, Luminex uh, platform. And the second approach is to use an HLA specific multicolor fluorescent spot assay which is based on the same uh, um, uh, technology of a fluorospot acid, but rather than just using uh, a single HLA uh, and fluorochrome labeled uh, HLA monomer, uh, we can use different HLA labeled fluorochromes in the same well of a fluorospot assay, and then uh, we are capable of reading uh, different uh, HLA specificities uh, in each um, HLA fluorospot well. So improving and increasing the efficiency of the uh, assay and increasing the HLA repertoire of memory B cells in the circulation. So what are the novel clinical studies that have used these approaches and have been pub published during these two uh, years are these three uh, main uh, studies. And the first one was done in the post transplant setting. And as you can see here, what the authors aim or, or attempt to do was uh, they evaluated at the time of rejection, uh, either in protocol biopsies or in for cause biopsies, in patients with 
uh, antibody mediated rejection showing uh, BAMP lesions typically uh, uh, um, compatible of antibody mediated rejection, but with DSA or without DSA. And as you can see here, what the authors showed is that uh, both uh, group of patients uh, showed presence of high frequencies of memory B cells uh, in the circulation. So suggesting that the effector mechanism was the same. And actually, the, as you can see on the right panel, the uh, evolution of this graph was uh, pretty, uh, so were similar, those patients with ABMR and DSA, as well as those, as, sorry, as, as well as those with ABMR and memory B cells develop uh, or showed a poor graph uh, evolution as compared to those without memory B cell or DSA. And finally, another study uh, performed by the group of France class uh, by using this isolation um, DSA uh, in the uh, supernatants of memory B cell expanded culture. They evaluated this at the pre transplant setting in a group of highly sensitized individuals or patients that underwent transplantation. And what they show, interestingly, as you can see here, is that patients with both memory B cells and, and, and donor specific antibodies were uh, uh, more prone to develop subclinical antibody mediated rejection as compared to those that only show DSA but not, uh, no memory B cells. So as a conclusion for this topic, uh, what is the current status? So the state of the art showed that it seems that we have sensitive and uh, an antigen specific tests to quantify donor specific memory B cell frequencies. Uh, there is some preliminary evidence for the clinical utility of such assays uh, involving in in vitro uh, differentiated differentiation of memory B cells in to antibody secreting cells, followed by either uh, solid assay bits, uh, Luminex platform, or Nelly spot uh, fluorospot <coughs> assay. But there remain some important open questions, whether do a specific types of sensitizing event resolve the different, the indifferently persistent memory B cells and DSA responses whether uh, the circulating memory B cell frequencies uh, behave the same or, or seem or have the same deleterious effect when they are found or detected prior or after transplantation. And also if there is a biological significant role for non HLA specific autoreactive B cells and antibodies and whether there is need for their quantification. And likewise to uh, the T cell memory whether uh, the peripheral blood sufficiently reflect the HLA, the HLA specific memory B cell compartment present in secondary lymphoid <clears throat> And therefore, the recommendations that we uh, need uh, multi center perspective clinical studies on relevant patient populations uh, to un better understand the value of these um, assays. And thank you very much. Thank you, Oriol. Uh, we're going to have a short period for uh, QA. So uh, I'd like all the members of the two first groups to join us with their cameras on. Um, please. Um, and I'll start with a question to the, actually two questions to the uh, primary group. I'm going to combine them together. Uh, one talks about the need for having high resolution typing before we can start uh, doing uh, molecular mismatch analysis. And the other one uh, refers to um, specifically the allocation issue, um, say, agreeing that we cannot use molecular mismatch uh, analysis for uh, allocation, but asking about um, something similar maybe to the acceptable mismatch um, a program that they have in Eurotransplant. Is that ready for prime time? So I'll give it to the primary group to answer. Sure. So maybe I can answer the part about um, do we need two field? I think prospectively going forward, there's no reason we shouldn't be doing two field uh, high resolution typing. Um, most HLA labs are supporting not only uh, solid organ, but bone marrow uh, programs, and they're doing it for bone marrow. So I think that's a viable option. Um, can we impute? Uh, it depends where you're starting from. If you're starting from a serologic level and not, and her group uh, with uh, Leuven has shown that that's not actually possible. If you're starting from already what I would call intermediate resolution with some high resolution, I think you can get pretty accurate. But again, we should be really moving to uh, two field uh, prospectively. And where, we're, where we can use some imputation is maybe with retrospective cohorts where we can't do anything other than that. Uh, in terms of the second question, perhaps Sebastian wants to talk about the use of uh, epaulets and, um, and uh, defining really antibody specificities. The acceptable mismatch. Yeah. Yes, and the acceptable mismatch program. 
Yeah, yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, so basically what we do in Eurotransplant is that we use the, uh, the information uh, on, uh, on, on applets uh, or triplets even, that's, that's what we use to, still the old version for that, is uh, to look for uh, acceptable, acceptability. So not to uh, rule out unacceptable antigens, but uh, to see uh, which uh, uh, alleles are, uh, are acceptable and then uh, use the applet information or triplet information on, on these alleles to sort of uh, extend the uh, acceptable uh, antigen repertoire uh, for antigens carrying those alleles. Thank you. Um, I'll have just one question for the uh, memory group because we're running out of time. Um, summarizing a few questions here, I guess that I will ask um, if you need to choose one approach because it seems as uh, none of them is really ready for prime time to use clinically. If you need to choose one approach uh, to put your money on, what, what will be the best uh, bang for the buck in developing uh, assays for um, 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 identifying memory responses? And I know there's gonna be a lot of discussion here, but... <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Thank you, Anna. I think it's a very difficult question because actually, um, I mean, you know, I mean, it's very different if you want to monitor or track memory T cells or memory B cells. So the outcome can, uh, the information is really complementary. And uh, so uh, the problem is to, to, to say which is the, te the technique or the tool which is more advanced uh, uh, right now. And, and I think most of them are, are pretty much in the same uh, status and they really need to be implemented in an interventional trial to, to, to show really that what we are detecting are really, is really clinically relevant. Um, I don't know if the others want to add something. Uh, on that. Yeah, I, I would just um, agree with that. You know, I think that um, the, the Ellie spot um, gives us a lot of information and mostly quantitative um, information, right, about the frequency of donor reactive cells and, and definitely their, um, their gamma function, but that, that's a single measure. Um, and so I would argue that, you know, quality is um, another important aspect. And, and so if I, you know, I guess, can the answer be both, meaning we want um, the LE spot to measure quantity, the immunophenotypes really give us a picture of the quality of those cells. And until we have a better assay that actually can enumerate, you know, the frequency of cells and give us granular information about the phenotypes, trafficking ability, functional ability, um, survival ability of those cells, we won't have a, a full picture. And so that, that's where I think we need to focus our efforts. Thank you. So I think this is a big shout out for the NIH to start funding studies to look at uh, that because I think those are tools that we really need uh, to help us. I think we'll pause here and hopefully we'll have time to get back to questions because I do see um, some more questions in the Q&A uh, box, but I do want to move uh, to our third presentation of uh, today, uh, which talks about the attributes of HLA antibodies. So I think at this moment, uh, I'll thank everyone and I will invite uh, um, Anna Morris and Jean-Luc Dupin to present that section of the presentation. Hi, hi everybody. I'm Jean-Luc from Paris. Um, I'm, I'll talk about the attributes of HLA antibodies with Anna uh, from Emory. Uh, we, I will first want to, 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 to thank Brian for the coaching, fantastic coaching. Uh, thank, thanks to Annette and Peter for the opportunity to, to, to participate to the STAR uh, group. Thanks to Ellen and Owe for the participation to these very specific uh, thematics. So we don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to, to disclose. So next slide, Anna, please, thank you. I will detail the current state of the attributes of HLA antibodies in the clinical field. And then Anna will take the microphone to discuss about the current state of research dealing with the fundamental mechanisms of HLA antibody induced cellular damage. And she will give you a great, great talk. You, you will see that. First of all, my, 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 uh, my topic, <clears throat> the clinical field, attributes of HLA antibodies and DSA. So I, I run through the uh, PubMed literature uh, that was published between January uh, 18 to March 21. 
I found around uh, 170 articles with the uh, keywords that were uh, that are described below in the table. Uh, to make it short, for uh, the five topics we had to discuss, I found almost no papers for a DSA titer and antibody titer. Uh, we had to discuss about ability and affinity of uh, DSA and HLA antibodies, which is a novel uh, uh, topic in the, in the STAR meeting. And we found very, very few articles too. And I had to go through a, a longer time period to have a few more papers, but total is not more than six. For HLA uh, antibodies of the IgM isotype, we don't have many as well, only two papers. Uh, related to this field. For uh, IgG subclass, which is something which is quite common in the, in the literature and the routine, we had 11. And the last topic, which is not the least uh, related to uh, complement activation by, by anti-HLA antibodies, we uh, run up to 23 papers related to C1Q and 19 to C3D. So the total was 57 out of the 170, and this is because I removed all the reviews, the case reports, all the papers which did, did not, which did not uh, directly relate to the topics because they were just keywords that were used in the, in, the, in the abstract or introduction without any data relevant to the, to the topic. Next, please, Anna. So let's start first with DSA titer. So uh, Howie told me not to start with a negative uh, uh, aspect, but I have no uh, other uh, thing to say that nothing new was published since the last STAR uh, 2019 meeting. Um, so it remains to say that the association that is usually observed in solid phase assays between in vitro complement binding and high antibody type tighter has not been explored further. Among the limitations, we have to, to keep the last one that was, uh, that was set in the previous uh, STAR meeting, that test costs can limit the routing testing of uh, this of TSA search uh, uh, with titration in the clinic, as of course you have to maybe test several dilutions to find out which one is the best one. Uh, the recommendation that can be done from all that is that there is still a need to completely define correlation between antibody strengths and titer with the mechanisms of in vivo graft injury, uh, uh, for example, like complement activation and microvascular inflammation that uh, Anna will detail in the second part of the talk. Uh, next, please, Anna. Regarding affinity, avidity of antibody against HLA molecules, I added the term concentration because uh, all of these are related. I told you that I found two articles in the literature. Both were from uh, the group I had the opportunity to, to lead in, in Bordeaux. Uh, there is another one which was published a few years ago that I added to the, to the discussion because it was uh, uh, significantly uh, 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 it was significant in terms of findings. First of all, we have to define uh, two terms. What is affinity and what is avidity? Affinity is, uh, in theory, for a single interaction between one FAB fragment of an antibody and one epitope, not an neplet, an epitope, which is the uh, interactant with the uh, FAB fragment. Avidity is different. Avidity is to be used when uh, the interactants are at least bivalent, which means you have more than one interaction occurring. So bivalent uh, interactants, it's uh, uh, evident for uh, antibodies, which are for IgGs bivalent. And for the antigen, it should be a monovalent antigen when you talk about HLA molecules because they are not supposed to have repeated epitopes or epilets in their sequence. But as we use um, uh, solid phase assays, it's uh, almost the same as having uh, a repeated uh, uh, epitopes as the HLA molecules are bound to a solid, uh, uh, a solid uh, phase. 
So uh, I told you, uh, very few works were published. Uh, the problem is that uh, looking for these parameters is very, very challenging because you have many interactions uh, in the serum that can uh, uh, make things very complex. And this is what we call non-specific binding, but not only non-specific, you have the interaction of complement uh, when it is activated uh, on the techniques uh, that are used. And for the moment, the quite the only uh, technique that has been used is surface plasmon resonance that you may know as the biocore uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, these parameters are quantitative, of course, so they are very, very interesting. You can measure ponderal concentration and uh, in co interaction constants, but the parameters you measure may be uncertain because as you cannot work with uh, pure serum, you have to purify IgGs, at least at the moment. And when you purify IgGs, you may purify only part of them is the yield is, may not be 100% and is probably not 100%. When you purify them, you have to elute them uh, after you have purified them on your, usually a colon. And when you elute them, you may denature part of, part of them. So maybe you lose uh, part of the uh, antibodies that are specific for your antigen. So all these make the conclusions of these uh, works uh, very uh, uncertain and the correlations be between single antigen MA5 values and binding uh, equilibrium constant are not great and even quite poor. And in addition, you have to consider, and it was uh, showed, uh, shown in one uh, of the papers I referred to, it was shown that the uh, structural epitope, which surrounds the epilet, uh, plays a role in the uh, affinity you, or avidity you can measure. So it's not uh, straightforward from the epilet to the affinity or avidity. The limitation is mainly the current available approaches that do not seem very appropriate for reaching the objective beyond monoclonal antibodies. Uh, as when you use complex uh, matrix, matrices like serum, it's much more, much more, much more complicated. So the recommendation for the moment is to, uh, to highlight the need for developing assays that are able to measure these parameters uh, in order to better understand uh, first uh, the evolution of the humor anti-HLA alloimmune response with time, as you know that antibodies uh, get better with time in front of the antigen. And also uh, this would help to, to explain or understand the pathogenicity of uh, DSAs with the mechanism Anna will, will uh, talk about. Regarding IgM isotype, Again, very few articles. I found two that were uh, interesting and uh, uh, experimentally relevant to the topic. The pathogenicity of IgM antibodies are poorly understood. They are not really considered in the routine, but they are there and they may play a role that we don't understand very well at the moment. Anti-HLA IgM also participate in uh, the complement interference phenomenon when you have IgGs and IgMs, the situation becomes very complex because both of them can activate the complement and there is an interplay between uh, them which makes things very uh, difficult to, to decipher. For IgM as DSA, there is one uh, study, the one by Everly, uh, which uh, found that uh, IgM DSA were present in almost 30% of patients in the Belatacept benefit study. And they showed that they converted less into IgG in the Belatacet arm than in the cyclosporin control arm. So there may be uh, things to, to discover by, by looking at that closer. The problem is that uh, only one clinical situation, which is the one I, I described just before, has been analyzed. So uh, there is not much uh, information available ab about IgM uh, antibodies in general in the HLA field in low reactive uh, settings. So the recommendation would be to keep working 
on this topic and especially on IgM prevalence in, uh, in uh, normal transplant patients, let's say uh, like that. Next slide, please, Anna. Regarding uh, IgGs, uh, one interesting topic is the definition and the uh, distribution of IgG subclasses in, in blood. You, we have, uh, I, uh, I said, 11 papers. Uh, I wrote here the references of the four best ones for me, at least. So quite a significant number of works in the, published in the last three years. It's quite low, but it's still uh, significant. They confirm what was previously known uh, uh, regarding the higher prevalence of IgG1 and IgG3 among the four subclasses. They also confirm the stronger clinical association of IgG3 with acute rejection. One paper introduced a new technology, which was mass spectrometry, as a possible alternative to subclass determination with conjugate uh, antibodies uh, in fluorescence assays like uh, Luminex single antigen uh, beads. But there is only one report using this technique. The limitation uh, of uh, all this is that uh, when you look at the papers using uh, subclass specific antibodies to determine IgG subclass composition of a serum, uh, we are not sure that the subclass antibodies that are chosen are really specific and it's, not, it's known that they are not. And if you look at the three papers who used uh, uh, single antigen uh, assays to analyze uh, IgG subclass, which means uh, the four of them without the Pernin paper above at the top of the slide, you have seven different uh, anti-IgG subclass antibodies used for uh, four subclasses, which means uh, almost two antibodies diff uh, which were different for each subclass. The only one which was the same in all the papers was the IgG3 subclass antibody. So uh, the recommendation to be done, to be made is the same as it was uh, written in the STAR-19 uh, uh, report. Pursue the development and the validation of uh, verified uh, reagents prior to consider the implementation of this assay into clinical decision. Next slide, please, Anna. The last topic was a complement uh, binding and activation with uh, Luminex derived C1Q and C3D assays. More papers, as I said, uh, both on, on the experimental part and the clinical field. Experimental uh, papers, three for C1Q and four regarding C4D, C3D, sorry, with the main ones uh, which are. Uh, 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 written here. In the clinical field, as you see, we had out of the total of something like 23 for C1Q, 20 papers uh, in the clinical field for C1Q, but with 17 dealing with kidney transplantation. For C3D, uh, from the 19 papers, 11 uh, regarding the kidney and 15 total in the clinical field out of the 19. So the kidney is not overrepresented. We cannot say that, but is very, very well uh, studied. For the others, uh, the other organs, uh, as you can see, liver, lung, and heart, very, very poor. Only one or two papers uh, published uh, in the recent years, which means that the knowledge we have about these uh, antibody attributes uh, in these organs is very poor. I uh, gave you the references of six papers, six or seven papers that I found mo most interesting in the past two or three years. And the six that are underlined are those who use two, the two tests in the same study, uh, which gives the opportunity to compare them, which is something which is not that frequent and which, which is interesting. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and which will be my, my last slide uh, before Anna takes the microphone. Uh, 
Uh, as a summary, what we can say is that more and more uh, articles recognize these two assays as a risk factor, when they are positive, as a risk factor for accelerated graft loss. They are definitely associated with higher DSA strengths, which is reflected by MFI level that we measure in the standard IgG uh, flow bead assays. Assays comparison, six articles I told you about, uh, suggests when you look at them carefully, a slight advantage for C3D over C1Q. Uh, you have no paper showing a superiority of C1Q over C3D. You have two articles out of the six which show a C3D advantage over C1Q, which is not a, a, a huge difference, but it's still in the uh, a, in the uh, in the same direction of maybe a superiority of C3D over C1Q. <clears throat> a last point, which is sometimes uh, analyzed in uh, the papers I, I told you about, is the search for in situ DSA, graph bound DSA, which seems to be associated with serum C1Q C3D positivity and or C3D positivity, which is related to MFI level. So all these parameters are seemed to go all together in the same direction. The more antibody you have, the more activation and the more deposition you have uh, in situ. The limitations, we only have retrospective studies, which are usually of small size and not, I mean, all of them are small, of small size. And so far, no prospective study has been published. And as I said, very few works outside kidney recommendations to be done, uh, the same as in the 19th uh, report of the STAR group, uh, especially table two from this report is still valid. It was a table which described the clinical validity and clinical uh, utility of the parameters that were studied, no, no change. Uh, clinical utility is not yet demonstrated. The positive correlation, which is confirmed between high, between high DSA MFI level and or high DSA IgG titers and increased risk for AMR and or graft loss. However, it's not because you have a low level of HLA DSA that uh, nothing will happen, will happen. And so the recommendation remains not to confuse absence of DSA complement binding activity in flow bead assays and lack of detrimental activity of DSA. And I'm done. Uh, and Anna, it's yours. Uh, it's your turn. Thanks, John Luke, for taking us through the current state of the attributes in the clinical field of HLA antibodies. So now we'll pivot. Uh, a bit to discuss how these HLA antibodies can mediate graft damage and cause rejection. And so to do that, I'll take us through the current state of research concerning the fundamental mechanisms of HLA antibody induced cellular damage with the purpose to understand new biological mechanisms of cellular damage and to provide recommendations for further study with the hopes to provide clinical meaning to these pathways and encourage therapeutic discovery. Our literature search focused on recent research from 2018 to 2020 on several mechanisms of HLA antibody or DSA on graft dysfunction. So these categories can be divided into those that depend on the FC portion of DSA to elicit their effector function and those that do not. So the FC dependent mechanisms that we'll discuss are HLA antibody induced leukocyte recruitment via FC receptors, antibody induced ADCC by NK cells, FC silylation on antibody signaling and how that impacts antibody signaling. And then our FC independent categories uh, are HLA antibody induced leukocyte recruitment via cell signaling and antibody induced cytokine and chemokine production, antibody induced anaphylatoxin production, and finally antibody induced cellular signaling via complement activation. And to more easily digest and comprehend these mechanisms, I put together this figure with the caveat that there are varying levels of evidence to prove that these are critical pathways of damage of ABMR. And so each of these proposed pathways require more research and I'll go through each of them individually. And so uh, to start, the first set of mechanisms we'll discuss are the FC dependent mechanisms, which require ligation of the FC portion of the antibody to FC receptors that can then induce leukocyte recruitment. 
And before I launch in, I would like to orient you to the summary section here where I've included graphics for how the research on this pathway was performed with a petri dish for in vitro, a mouse for in vivo or murine work, and a human for human studies. So interestingly, the work the past few years showcases the ability for antibody to bind FC receptors on various immune cells like T and B cells and macrophages and elicit their recruitment and polarization. Uh, furthermore, there has been particular SNPs of uh, FCRs, FC receptors, that portend worse graft outcomes, indicating that FC receptor ligation is an important mediator of graft damage. However, the mechanisms for injury, although suggested, uh, have not been completely identified, and it's likely that the DSA characteristics that John Luke just mentioned, like titer and subclass, and um, what I'll talk about in a few slides, glycosylation status, can all impact FC receptor binding. Uh, and so due to the complexity as well as of FC receptor expression on various immune cells combined with the activating to inhibitory ratio, there's still much more research to be done as to whether these pathways are targetable and would be of therapeutic potential. And so our recommendations are to confirm the specific impact of the FC region of anti-HLA antibodies on leukocyte recruitment uh, by performing mechanistic studies and to uh, uh, perform comprehensive and long-term studies assessing these FC receptor polymorphisms on graft function and injury prior to uh, bringing prospective FC receptor polymorphism testing uh, into the clinic. The second section within this FC dependent category is antibody induced ADCC by NK cells. Uh, most studies listed here associate NK cells with ABMR with no mechanistic data to actually describe how those NK cells are mediating damage. However, with the use of emlithidase uh, recently, that cleaves FC portion of antibody, DSA was in fact found to uh, activate NK cells and perform ADCC, uh, indicating it's a mechanism at play in patients with DSA. Uh, interestingly, one article suggests that up to one third of biopsies with NK cell infiltration did not have DSA. So although HLA antibody can in induce ADCC, this might not be the only mechanism capable of activating NK cells and leading to graft damage. Uh, as was suggested by uh, Roz earlier uh, this um, uh, webinar, uh, the absence of MHC class one or the response to chemoattractants could activate NK cells. Uh, currently, the major limitation uh, with these um, uh, studies is that the method for NK cell activation is still largely unknown. Uh, and so studies are needed to understand the characteristics of DSA that can stimulate ADCC and whether there's non-ADCC in case cell mechanisms at play. And so our recommendations are that those uh, mechanistic studies can be performed to define the role of NK cells in acute and chronic rejection scenarios to then identify targetable features of NK cells in rejection. And then secondly is to design studies to determine whether NK cell transcriptomic signatures can distinguish ABMR and TCMR because um, there are a few papers that uh, say yay and some that say nay. Uh, and so finally, within the FC dependent section, uh, there's been recent interest in the glycan status of antibodies. Uh, and so as I previously mentioned, that FC portion of the antibody can bind FC receptors and elicit effector functions uh, downstream on those cells that express those FC receptors. And so glycan modification on, on that FC portion of the antibody can alter how it binds to that receptor, and then um, it can impact uh, the signaling modalities downstream. And so uh, this has been shown in the reductive model of autoimmunity. And uh, the evidence for this in transplantation, uh, however, is limited and controversial. There's only a handful of papers uh, discussing it and they are controversial. And so uh, the impact of glycan modification in the multifaceted inflammatory state of transplant recipients is still unknown. And so our recommendation is to uh, implement comprehensive and prospective and time course trials of DSAs in transplant recipients uh, concerning glycan modification and then to design mechanistic studies to assess the feasibility of targeting glycan status as a therapy. And so that was that first, uh, 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 re the first section concerning the research of FC dependent effector functions of HLA antibody. And now we will discuss research concerning signaling downstream of HLA ligation uh, uh, on MHC. And so as I said, HLA antibody has been known to elicit signaling downstream of the HLA molecule when bound, and that's likely through the recruitment of co-receptors. And so these articles here provide evidence that signaling downstream of HLA or uh, outside in signaling 
promotes adhesion molecule upregulation, proliferation, and migration. Uh, further, class two DSA can drive uh, DC maturation and polarize TFH and has uh, further been found to be associated with the endothelial to mesenchymal transition, uh, although work is still needed to understand those uh, modalities involved. And so the limitations uh, for this mechanism of effector function is whether characteristics of DSA like affinity and avidity and titer can impact that outside end signaling. So that needs to be determined. And um, further, the redundancy of signaling modalities might complicate therapeutic manipulation. Uh, and so upstream or downstream targets could represent more achievable therapies. So our recommendation is that due to redundancies in signaling modalities, systematic studies to identify key co-receptors and or signaling targets should be developed to address whether and which pathways are in fact targetable. And so now we'll move on to uh, this uh, third section here on HLA antibody induced cytokine and chemokine signaling. So many studies have identified distinct cytokine and chemokine uh, transcriptome signatures in individuals with ABMR that likely have DSA compared to those with TCMR, indicating that ABMR results in a unique uh, cytokine uh, uh, production. And there's one paper that uh, provides evidence that in cold culture studies, the anti-class two antibodies can induce cytokine production, uh, namely IL-6, but due to the nature of the cold culture assay itself, the origin of cytokine production is unclear and further evidence for direct HLA antibody induced cytokine production is still needed. Uh, in addition, cytokines and chemokines have diverse and multifaceted functions on the immune system. And so really we would need a systematic approach to highlight the redundant functions uh, of those cytokines and potential therapeutic targets. Uh, our recommendation is that the complexity of cytokine and chemokine induction and maintenance justifies a detailed systematic approach to determine whether therapeutic targeting of one or more of these pathways results in diminished graft injury. And so finally, I'll move on to this last section here concerning HLA antibody induced complement activation and the resulting anaphylatoxin production and MAC formation. So interestingly, within the past few years, it's been found that HLA antibody ligation on endothelial cells results in complement activation and uh, subsequently anaphylatoxin production. And these anaphylatoxins can bind to anaphylatoxin receptors, which have been found uh, recently on CD4, CD8, and myeloid cells, uh, suggesting that these anaphylatoxins that are produced from, these, from antibody binding can recruit leukocytes via binding these anaphylatoxin receptors. Uh, so the limitation is that uh, there's group, uh, data from one group that suggests that uh, proximal complement inhibitors could be a strategy to eliminate anaphylatoxin production from the get-go, uh, including their downstream effector functions. Uh, but we need studies to confirm that. And we also need studies to uh, determine the clinical impact of HLA antibody-induced anaphylatoxins on graft function itself. And so our recommendation was that mechanistic studies to assess the link of uh, anti-HLA antibody dependent anaphylatoxin production and its receptor induced recruitment should be designed and implemented to determine whether this pathway is suitable for therapeutic targeting. And then finally, uh, we have, uh, in addition to anti-HLA antibody induced anaphylatoxin production following complement, uh, complement activation can also result in MAC formation on endothelial cells, which is known to cause pores in the membrane leading to cell lysis. But these articles provide evidence of a non-lytic, non-canonical signaling pathway that when MAC uh, is formed, uh, signaling downstream results in NF-kappa B stabilization, inflammasome formation, and cytokine production, including IL-1 uh, beta, IL-18, and IL-15. So the clinical relevance of these pathways in mitigating graft damage is still needed and unknown. Uh, and, and then confirmation that targeting one or more of these effectors uh, in this pathway that could reduce damage is also needed. And so our recommendation is to obtain confirmation that non-canonical signaling downstream of MAC is a major component of environmental changes in graft damage. And then uh, two, to design therapeutic efficacy studies to assess whether manipulation of this pathway can reduce endothelial cell uh, activation and subsequent damage. And so I hope you can see with this illustration, we're coming back around uh, too, that we are in a unique and complex position to not only understand each of these mechanistic functions of antibody on cellular damage, but also identify targetable features on these pathways to prevent uh, that damage.
Um, so despite only being based on preliminary data, there is vast potential to manipulate uh, the damage induced downstream of antibody. And as we further elucidate these pathways, it will become clear uh, which, uh, which we're able to target. And it's likely that not just one will be critical in mitigating graft damage. And who knows what we have not yet discovered yet that we'll find as we move forward. So thank you so much for your attention. It was our goal to show you the current status of research on the effector functions of antibody with the hopes that as more research is developed, these mechanisms of damage will result in clinical assays or therapies in the clinic. And with that, I'll um, uh, close with uh, showing our uh, antibody working group, attribute of antibody working group, and um, we'll stop and take questions. Thank you so much, Anna. That was uh, phenomenal between you and uh, Jean-Luc. It was really absolutely a fantastic overview of our clinical practices and the um, um, research uh, that is uh, coming along the line. I will ask the rest of the attribute group uh, to please join us for uh, questions. And I will start uh, with the first uh, question um, talking about uh, um, specifically uh, glycosylation. So the problem is that both in vivo and in vitro studies, um, it was shown that it's very difficult to purify uh, the DSAs. Um, so how would you um, um, recommend to use uh, glycosylation studies in, in lieu of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one of, <clears throat> as I was thinking through these studies and what to do, um, adsorption studies would be where I would go to how to pull out uh, the DSA of particular and then assess the silation status of those particular DSAs. And that has been lacking in the studies that I mentioned. Um, they have looked at total IgG or they have looked at um, uh, DSAs. Um, well, yeah, they both looked at total IgG and so they've not purified that I, um, uh, DSA in particular. So. Um, that will be a complex uh, issue moving forward with how to study this. I think so, I'm going to jump in just a little bit ahead, in that and, and say that uh, another way to do this is we're going to need to have the input from industry, from the manufacturer of these solid phase beads. And, and those types of, of ideas have been discussed already. But uh, the amount of, of beads necessary to purify DSA at, to the level that we're going to need is going to require something that would be uh, out of hand costly to, to do it any other way. Actually, let me add to this because I've been doing a lot of uh, adsorption elution studies in the last couple of years. And um, what you're pulling out is uh, very complex still, even if you have what is called the single, single beads. Um, so I, I think we are yet to appreciate the complexity of HLA antibodies um, at large, uh, but I, I do agree that's uh, probably uh, the, the best first step uh, in order to go there and uh, help from our industry will be very, very um, important. Uh, I'm sorry, Elaine, were you uh, trying to say something? No, I, I completely agree. I think the heterogeneity of the immune response, the number of epitopes, it will be difficult to decipher. I think the best way is single antigen molecules to look at the interactions and look at the glycosylation status. But I think uh, it's a complex question if there are multiple antibodies binding to the different epitopes. So it's hard, but I think it's the best way to start. We need to the, the, the other approach you could go, in, and again, I don't know how, how robust these are for pulling out uh, DSAs, and I'll come back to Sebastian here, is I think the Leiden group has been making um, HLA expressed uh, cell lines that try to get at this, you know, as a reagent that they could use, it's a little bit easier to get at maybe than the expense of the beads that, that everyone's recognizing. So Sebastian, have you been successful in, in absorbing out um, single DSA specificities with your cell lines? So we have not done that with our cell lines and um, we, we have done some work on, on uh, trying to pull out DSAs, uh, by using beads and then indeed looking at glycosylation, but it's it's a very difficult process to do. And, um, and the thing is, um, you, you might want to go for a very well, limited specificity, but in the end, in a patient, of course, it's the whole polyclonal mix that is, is uh, giving uh, potential damage. So it's very difficult to decipher and then put it all back together again. Mm 
And of, um, maybe a similar question, a little bit like causation, like causation sciolations. There is a, a question here. What is the estimated percentage of sciolated antibody in serum? Um, have you come up with anything about this, Anna or Jean-Luc, or the whole group as you guys reviewed the literature? I believe that is um, that was tested in one of the, it was either the Barba paper or the Malliard Castagnette um, paper. They both looked at uh, sciolation status uh, proportion. I can't recall off the top of my head what that is, but I would refer you to those manuscripts. It's incredibly low. Okay. Uh, ba based on, on uh, what was in the literature from some, some of the basic researching <laughs> groups. Uh, for example, in, in IVIG, it represented 1% exactly. of the total. I was gonna agree with Howie that uh, they've studied IVIG and that's very low percent. Talking about IVIG, oh. there is a question here asking about uh, the uh, pathways uh, and in the impact of IVIG therapy on pathways of antibody mediated damage. Yes, I, I think that's a great question. The, the um, mechanism of IVIG and how it actually alters these pathways is largely unknown. Uh, and, and why we think it works in patients is still unknown. Um, I, I think that's a great research area to study going forward. And I think I'm going to take a uh, last question before we will um, have to uh, part um, and I can invite the rest of the group to uh, join us as I do this. It's more of a, a comment, uh, but I wonder if you guys have any thoughts. Um, the um, attributes uh, and specificity, uh, such as HLA, uh, DQ antibodies have been associated uh, with uh, ABMR treatment of them uh, had shown uh, um, that, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, the titer and the complement uh, binding for HLA-DQ were going down uh, with the treatment. Is there anything specific to HLA-DQ that you guys have uh, found as attributes um, being associated with a worse outcome, I guess? Uh, regarding this point, I would have to look at the literature more closely because I don't remember, but. I mean, just there's an overwhelming response to DQ as we've all know. And I think the right. molecular mismatch story explains in le at least in part, but I don't think that we identified a particular attribute of, for example, a complement fixation or titer, but it is the predominant immune response. Right, so I think that is really, really quick, really interesting. Why are those antibodies more pathogenic than others, right? Um, and it will be um, great to have studies that look at that um, as a part of this. Uh, we're, we're coming up, I wanna Let's, say to the hour, is, back to the hour and a half, sorry, go ahead. Let's go back to us looking at T cell immune responses. And I, I would wanna suggest that we consider that. I think we had a very nice report from the cellular group today. And I think we probably need to get back to understanding a little bit more about the basic biology of immune response to DQ and also the expression in tissues. This is just a completely un, untouched, untapped area. And I think it was a very nice presentation and we should put DQ at, at, on the list <laughs> as a molecular target. Thank you. Mindy, do you wanna say something? Sorry. No, no, I was just, uh, that's a really interesting take on it. I hadn't, um, you know, thought of it in that way before. So thanks, Elaine, for that really interesting comment. And I think, I think we have to actually also understand why these are more, like there's DR and DQ antibodies that are clearly more persistent than some of the class one antibodies. And what's the biology behind persistence is, is really a, another aspect to consider. I mean, they're very hard to get rid of when they show up, as you know and they cause damage and it's frustrating. You almost give up when you find them, you're like, ugh. <laughs> and yet on the other side of the coin, uh, they can be there and do nothing. And, and so one has to start thinking about not just function, but also the amount of target that's expressed. And I think that's an, an, an basically under investigated area. I've been saying yeah. that for a long time. Yeah. Or my Go ahead, Elaine. The one thing we know, the one thing we know about signal transduction is class two is a different molecular mechanism than class one. So I think the molecules that are recruited in the downstream effector functions are different. So I think that might lend to some of the pathogenesis, but it still doesn't explain why everything is focused on class two. 
rather than class one late, especially late in transplant. Yeah, and, and mostly DQ. Uh, guys, um, it's phenomenal. Uh, I would want to invite uh, everyone listening to us and everyone they know to join us uh, in Phoenix in February 2022, where we're going to have the summation of uh, those discussions and would like to bring up as more questions as uh, possible. In the interim, if you didn't get your uh, question answered or if you have additional questions as you think about it, please make sure to email us. Uh, I know there will be a link uh, coming up. I see Brian uh, on the screen, so he will finalize, finalize this. There will be a link uh, for the recordings uh, and Brian uh, will hopefully send at least my email, but um, I'm sure everyone else from the group will be happy to uh, get those questions so that we can try to address them as we're coming to uh, the final report. Brian? Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Tambor. We would like to take a moment to thank all of our panelists and attendees for not only today's session, but the great uh, sessions on both days, Tuesday and Thursday. We'd also like to thank AST and ASHI leadership for making the session like this possible. Uh, after we close the session today, please take a moment to fill out our evaluation survey link to help us keep our content current and engaging and to help the, the drive for the uh, 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 towards the CIOT uh, 2020 meeting in uh, February of next year uh, or March of next year, excuse me. Finally, please take a note that the archive will be available next week, uh, the archive recording. When the videos are posted, we will provide an update to AST and ASHI members on where to view the recordings. Thank you all again for your participation in both of these fantastic sessions. Take care and have a great day today. Thank you all.